with all major units of the Joint Task Force at their overseas bases, final phases of training began in earnest, with installations and modifications of equipment being simultaneously accomplished. Final coordination of the tremendous organization had begun. To simulate the test able bombing mission, a practice bombing range was constructed on Eric Island. A coral strip was cleared, approximating the top side dimensions of the primary target. Four spotting towers were placed on the island for plotting the bomb drops by the transit method. These towers were manned by Los Alamos personnel. A radar detachment was established on Prayer Island, one and a half miles east for the purpose of tracking the bomb carrying aircraft, communicating with the bombing commander, estimating bomb impacts, making weather reports, and obtaining high altitude wind data. Training was intense, not only for the air crews practicing bomb drops over Eric Island, but for all other airmen, as they flew their assigned courses in the exact positions described by the air plan. Training was equally exacting for the many crews on ground stations and aboard ships, all essential cogs in the maneuvers. The air attack unit carried out 23 missions in which practice bombs were dropped and six dress rehearsals for a total of 29 major training operations in which simulated atomic bombs were dropped. The average circular error was 537 feet, a remarkable record. Practice bombing missions for crossroads developed bombing techniques to a point that might not have been attained in several years of routine training. Bomb crews learned to make corrections for differences between winds at bombing altitude and those observed by the radar unit. At Bikini, it was noted that winds at lower altitudes were sometimes at right angles to winds at the prospective bombing altitude. Conventional methods for ballistic wind corrections did not permit compensation for such a cross-trail component. A method was found for estimating this deflection error and correcting for it. This proved one of the valuable results of the tests. Weather characteristics at Bikini resulted in a decision to move the orbit of the photoplanes into 12 miles slant range on Able Day, three miles closer than had originally been scheduled. Results bore out the wisdom of this decision. Photographs at the closer range showed better scale and improved definition. Because of the low elevation of Kwajalein, a ramp and a bomb loading pit were needed. Seabees erected a ramp capable of supporting a B-29. This led to the pit. When the bomber was in position over the pit, powerful hoisting equipment was used for loading. Air-sea rescue units were given elaborate training and coordinated with the operational flight plan. These seaplane groups operated a shuttle service between Ibai and Bikini and participated in reconnaissance. A second air-sea rescue unit was established at Kwajalein because of the possibility of takeoff accidents during the air activities there. Never before has a field experiment depended so much upon photography. No other event in history has been so extensively documented by means of the camera's eye. There were cameras everywhere, in the air, on the land, on the sea, and beneath the sea. Some in towers on the atoll were shielded by lead an inch thick. Others, such as these in the B-17 drones, were aimed by television as they dived into the atomic cloud. Virtually every type of camera available was used in one capacity or another. Relative importance was almost equally divided between still and motion pictures, each being used to complement the other in recording phenomena. While the photographic coverage of crossroads constitutes a complete and detailed record of the operation and provides an invaluable historical document, the primary objective of the photographic units was to deliver film technically qualified to serve as a basis for scientific analysis. This called for precision and control in all phases of the operation, from maneuvering of aircraft to operation of photographic equipment. Photography provided the basic instrument for accurate measurements of movement as a function of time. This was required to analyze blast forces and other properties of the bursts. Cameras in fixed ground positions on the island offered relatively few problems in photographic control. In the air, camera platforms consisted of aircraft orbiting the target at fixed altitudes and given slant ranges 
at ground speeds as high as 300 miles per hour. The exact position of each camera aircraft in space at time of detonation had to be recorded. The exact position of the bomber in space at the instant of bomb release and the exact position of the target ships in relation to each other a few seconds before detonation had to be determined. These relative positions were determined by photogrammetric plotting and radar plotting, each using photography as a prime implement. An electronic control system was devised for starting cameras automatically. This employed a radio relay receiver in each photographic aircraft to pick up timing signals from the Cumberland Sound and time delay relay controls to distribute the different starting impulses required by the various camera setups. For example, the relay control operated by a signal at H minus two seconds started a Fastex high speed camera at minus one and a half seconds and also started an Eastman high speed camera at minus five tenth seconds. Remote control boxes started turret cameras and K24 cameras. Sequence control equipment started three or six high speed cameras in a sequence pattern. A time recorder was designed to provide an accurate time record of the operation of cameras. This consisted of a motion picture camera which photographed 24 small indicator lights mounted on a panel around a precision clock. Ultra high speed motion picture cameras were operated at speeds as high as 2000 frames per second. Some cameras had cylindrical lenses and moving strip films to record the intensity of the light from the explosions. Other cameras moving great strips of film continuously were called streak or blur cameras and interrupted light beam recorders. Moving drum spectrographic cameras were designed and built to get the wavelength distribution of light at all stages of the flash. Nine 75 foot steel towers were erected on three islands of the atoll, Bikini, NU, and Amon. These towers provided camera platforms on fixed axes and were equipped with electrical controls which could be triggered by gremlin timers. At other stations on Bikini and NU, were some extraordinary photographic devices. These included instruments that could separate events one-tenth of a millionth of a second apart. The rate of shock wave expansion was to be measured by long focus, high-speed cameras coupled with light beacons dispersed within the target array to determine the properties of the shock wave as a function of distance. The rate of development of the ball of fire and the unfolding of temperatures were to be recorded spectrographically light intensity was to be followed photometrically in three colors. The bomb burst was the nearest parallel to the atmosphere of a star that man could produce. Yet, these measuring instruments were within five miles of the radiating surface. Information of interest to astrophysicists would have evolved from these instruments. All this information was to be recorded within a few milliseconds, and there would be but one opportunity. It was a misfortune that this opportunity was lost through failure of the timing signals. The automatic control for triggering the equipment was rendered useless by a premature start, and the change to manual control was not made in time to record initial phases of the burst. Nineteen Army Air Force planes and 17 naval aircraft provided a camera umbrella for the tests unlike any the world had ever seen. Eight F-13s and two C-54s were modified for the job. Each F-13 carried 38 cameras, and each C-54 carried 32 cameras. The B-17 drones were also equipped with automatic cameras. Navy aircraft assigned to photographic work included F-6Fs, TBFs, and PBMs. Automatically triggered cameras were placed aboard many of the target vessels, and cameras aimed from observer ships augmented this battery. New optical instruments, glare-reducing icaroscopes, were used for the first time to photograph the early stages of the ball of fire. More than 1,500,000 feet of motion picture film were exposed during the operation, and the number of still pictures exceeded one million. Field laboratories were set up at the Army Air Base on Kwajalein and aboard the Sidor. Chief processing and assembly point 
was the Naval Photographic Center in Washington, where new techniques were used for filing of the material. Commercial laboratories were also used for processing color film. To record necessary data during the tests, a great many new instruments were designed and manufactured, while thousands of standard instruments were brought into play. The manifold effects of the detonations required instruments to measure pressures and impulses, electromagnetic propagations, radioactivity, nuclear radiation, optical radiation, strains and stresses, winds, temperatures, waves, and many other local and remote phenomena. Elaborate sets of instruments were necessary to record seismological and oceanographic information. Pressures and impulses in the air and water, orientation of vessels with respect to zero point, shock wave velocities, and the amount, quality, and time variations of light were also among the data to be determined. Many of the instruments were complicated and highly classified. Some were known only as black boxes. Others were such simple objects as pipes, cans, and oil drums. Still others were ball crusher gauges, aluminum foil rupture gauges, wire strain gauges, and piezoelectric gauges. Readings from many instruments were broadcast by radio and immediately telemetered. Some of the unusual measurements included changes in terrestrial magnetism, atmospheric pressure and conductivity, and ionospheric reflectivity. For remote measurements, field groups were situated at 34 widely spaced stations throughout the world. These outlying stations were to determine to what extent the occurrence of an atomic bomb explosion can be detected at great distance, a vitally important measure of defense. Detection methods included sensitive recording of radioactive content of the air, seismological measurements, and measurements of various radio anomalies. Choosing a target array best adapted for obtaining complete and accurate information was no small problem. Frequently, compromises in the choice of a target array had to be made by the various military units involved. No attempt was made to arrange the ships so that they would represent a fleet. This was not a test of air power against sea power. The array was not a tactical disposition. On the contrary, emphasis was on placement of vessels and equipment so that all graduations of damage would be obtained in direct relation to distance and orientation from zero point. Such data would serve as a basis for predicting what would happen in a variety of tactical situations now and in the future. Mechanical damage was to be studied from the standpoint of ships as whole entities and of ships divided into their various parts, such as hulls, machinery, fuel tanks, magazines, and living quarters. Congress limited the number of United States combatant vessels to be used as targets to 33. In all, 88 hulls were exposed in test able, of which 28 were United States combatant ships. For reasons of economy, it was necessary to use ships considered inferior to those of modern design. Although in many respects, the ships used were not comparable to modern United States vessels constructed during the latter stages of World War II, these ships would provide adequate information to determine the character of damage. Since it was not known within close limits where the center of damage would be, it was necessary to disperse the ships and also the test items and instruments they carried. This, in the light of later events, proved wise indeed. Before the Able Day target array was finally selected, 19 different target arrays had been weighed and rejected. Later, more accurate and consistent figures on air blast properties became available. These supported the demand for denser grouping of the ships around the center, especially within a thousand yards. Two British experts, Dr. W.G. Penny and Sir Geoffrey Taylor, suggested that the major combatant ships be placed in a sort of hexagonal arrangement around the point of aim. This would improve, they said, the range distribution under the random